Okay, so today you got exercise 108, uh, which has to do with stitching panoramic images together. But before we can actually stitch images, I want to do a little bit of instruction on what panoramic photography is. Um, and I will give you one caveat that is, uh, I wrote my thesis on, in and around panoramic photogra photography, so I really I like it as a subject matter. So uh, I'll show you a bunch of images because I think it's fun. Um, things have changed a bit since uh, the days of my thesis in terms of what technology is available, so I'll talk about some of the changes. Uh, and then we'll work to primarily today in Photoshop to stitch images together, but we'll also use a free program that's called Hugin that's available on these computers, but you can also download uh, on your own. And I think it's a much better solution than even Photoshop is at stitching images together. So you'll, you'll be able to explore both of those as options. Um, and we'll kind of walk through how that, how that process works. So uh, let's talk about a panorama is basically a very wide angle view of a particular space. And we tend to see, like if we, if we climbed up to the top of St. Peter's and we were looking out at Rome, uh, something along these lines, uh, we would see the whole city. And because we were there and we move our head slightly, our brain would get a really good image of this vast view, right? When we take a photograph on a traditional camera, we're limited to what the, the field of view of the camera is, right? And we're limited to a certain aspect ratio. And the idea behind a panorama is we're giving ourselves more uh, of an image, right? We're giving us a larger, broader image. A full 360 panorama basically means that the panorama, if we started in one place, we'd go all the way around and we'd come back to the same place. Right, so the 360. If we did a full 360 vertically, it would go all the way up into the sky and all the way down to our feet. So we have the ability to do a complete 360 if we wanted to, right? And so what we do is we take a bunch of individual images, and those images overlap. And as they overlap, we stitch them together. Uh, and there's some techniques involved in terms of how we get it done. But for the most part, the software that we're going to use, its job is to stitch the images together. Right? And in an ideal world, it would be completely seamless. We wouldn't see that one image blended into another image. But in reality, there's little artifacts that often happen. Okay, So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of how this works. Um, there is a point in your camera um, where the, the lens actually causes the image to go upside down. I'm going to pull this up. Actually, I should make this taller so that it's not so. Uh, this is my panorama rig, so to speak. But sometimes when we look at it in a live setting, it's a little bit easier for me to explain it than in photographs or in drawings. So I'll refer to both the screen and this. So there's a point works just like our eyes do. So there's a point at which, in the center of this camera lens, right? any image, come on, any image that's coming through the lens, right, it reverses and then hits the center, or it hits the image sensor. Okay? That point right, is called the nodal point of the camera. And so if we were shooting a, a panorama, what we want to do is we want to figure out where that point is, right, and we want to rotate the camera around that point. So the point is roughly inside here. And if I were to spin this around, my hand can stay in the same place, but the camera spins around that point. Does that make sense? Right? Furthermore, right, I can drop the camera down or I can drop it up, and it still stays in that same point. That's how I would shoot a full 360. So I can shoot high. Right? And this particular rig was, uh, you can buy these. We, bought, we uh, manufactured this, a friend and I, uh, because we didn't want to spend the 1000 bucks for the rig. That was what the pr going price was at the time. Uh, so we made this out of uh, uh, bendable aluminum. Anyway. So this is specifically for this particular camera with this particular lens. So I can't really change this. It's not adjustable. It's just for this particular purpose. In generic terms, if we were looking at it over here, let me set this over here for a second. If we had a generic camera, right? the first thing we need to do is isolate where that nodal point is in the center and rotate around it in the normal direction of rotation. Right? Then we figure out where it is in this direction, in the vertical direction, so that when we tip the camera, we tip it around. Okay? You probably, how many people have taken their phone and taken a panorama with their phone? Right? Anybody use the Google Sphere app to do it? Right? A few nods of the heads. It's a really cool app. Right? 
works great for outside. I'll show you uh, an image of it. But the reason that it works a little bit easier on a phone is because the lens nodal point is right about where the camera is. So there's not a lot of space. There's not, there's not much you can screw up. When you have a bigger camera, the distance is further. So you have to rotate differently. Okay. So anyway, we have to isolate that nodal point in order to get um, non-parallax images. So let me try to explain what parallax is. This is the, the bad news thing that can happen. Okay? And that is that when we have a point or some object that's in the foreground of the camera, right? and we have an object that's in the background of the camera. So if we were here, uh, let's say, Mustafa, I was looking at you were in the foreground, right? and Payam, you were in the background, and I were to take a picture at the two of you. You're in line right here. Okay? If I don't rotate around the nodal point of the camera, when I take the second picture, the two of you are no longer in line because of this phenomenon called parallax. Okay? So in this example here, right, you two are in line. Okay? As we come here and rotate the camera not around the nodal point, right, there's the line, but we see in the viewfinder the foreground image and the background image are separate instead of together like they should be. Okay? If instead we rotate around the nodal point of the camera, right, these two stay in line. So they're here in the center. When we move to the side, they're still in line. So that, that phenomenon is called parallax, and it's really apparent when you're trying to stitch images together. Get you, you get double columns and stuff like that when you have foreground and background objects. Okay? That's why the nodal point is important. So in terms of final outputs, uh, what do we get out of a panorama? Uh, we can have an unrolled image, which is a flattened image. We're going to see a lot of that today, and I'll show you a bunch of examples of that. The other thing that we can have is a QuickTime virtual reality movie um, that's an interactive thing. Um, this was really popular. Apple wrote QuickTime to be able to view these um, in about 2003 or so. Uh, technology's changed a bit. Now almost everything is web driven. Um, and so I'll show you an example of this in a little bit. I have some stuff put up on our website that you can see the, how the interactive stuff works. Actually, let's go ahead and look at that really fast right now. So on the digital tool site, maybe, under resources, I have panoramas. And I'm going to pick this first one, Angora Peak. That's fine. Go ahead and make this big. OK. So here, here looks like a photograph. But if I click and drag, you can see that I can actually move. I can look down, or I can look up. So it's interactive in that I can actually control what it is that I'm looking at. Right? And so the, the, the interactive nature of this is, obviously, if you, if you shoot the photographic image and you move around, there's something that's as if it were, you were there looking at it. Right? So we, as architects, when we go visit a site and we're trying to capture what it feels like to be in the site, very frequently uh, we take this kind of a panorama image so we can, quote, go back to the site and look at it again right? and, and understand what the experience would be to be there. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff done with this kind of thing and, and putting it into interactive goggles or whatever. So where you look, it changes. Uh, some phone apps, like how you move your phone, will as if you're moving in the panorama. So th there's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on. Uh, not all of these panoramas work. I accidentally deleted a few of them. Um, but they should, some of them should still be here. Nope, that one didn't work. I have to go back through and, and relink them together. So same same concept here, uh, international terminal, uh, and we have the interactive ability to look up, look down, etc. Right. This one's more of a 360. You can see that I can get up and look high into the sky, see those lights, right, and then obviously come back down, right, and I have a little bit of text that's at the very bottom in the center. Okay. So anyway, this is the the example of the interactive panorama. Uh, and so let's jump back to the other outputs here. Okay, so one is the QTVR interactive panorama, the other is an unrolled image. And I'll show you a bunch of unrolled images a little bit later on in this. So, in terms of software, how do we process this? Uh, the first thing is Photoshop. 
which obviously this is a class based on Photoshop, so no surprise, Photoshop is one of the skills that we're going to do. Um, <clears throat> it's available in the lab for you to, to work with. It does a remarkably good job with small groups of images. So if you went out to a site and you went snap, 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 right, you could, you could stitch those together really well. If you throw a full 360 at it, it'll go, I can't do it, right? Uh, it doesn't do particularly well in a large, highly wrapping set of images, right? It is an automated process just like it was with um, the merge to HDR. It's the same kind of thing. It'll do it for you. and It'll figure it out. Um, and it is available on Mac or PC. Um, another software program, which was originally independent, uh, it was made by a company called RealViz originally, uh, got bought by Autodesk. It was a great stitching application. It was very interactive. You dropped an image in. You dragged it around until it kind of lined up. You hit Enter, and then it tweaked the image and put it in. Uh, I did a lot of work with Stitcher as an application. The problem was Autodesk bought them and then completely stopped any development of <laughs> the application. So the last update on this was in 2009. So it's pretty out of date now. Uh, I don't even think it works on a lot of the, the newer operating systems. But it was a really good thing when it, when it worked. Um, the next set, uh, PT GUI, is vi virtually the same as Huggin, which is the one that we're going to use. Originally, Huggin was a little bit slower and not quite as good. PT GUI was the higher end version of it. They're essentially the same thing. Uh, they work really well because you can take two images and you can manually define this point on this image is this point in this image. And it will custom warp the image so that they can stitch together nicely. Um, best thing to do is for me to show you a live example when we go through it. Um, on the computer in a little bit. It's ba based on something called Pano Tools, which is an open source software that deals with how do you stitch images together. Okay? Um, and it's free. You can download it. Photosphere is written by Google. Um, it's available for iOS or Android. Uh, very cool, worth downloading. It's free. Um, very intuitive. Basically, it gives you a dot. You capture an image, and then it moves to the next dot, and you capture the next dot. Uh, and you can create a full 360 out of them. It works really, really well outside, uh, not so well inside. <laughs> um, anytime there's close objects, you tend to get weird exposures and, and pieces that don't really stitch together uh, nicely. But for, for being outside, it, it's great. Right? So let's look at some examples. Um, these are all ones that I've shot. Um, a lot of them are in Peru, but depending on where I've been, I've shot uh, panoramas. I used to be, like I said, this was my thesis. I used to be really into it. I used to spend a lot of time shooting panoramas. And then I had kids. <laughs> so, so much for that anymore, right? But um, anyway, uh, the, the key thing about looking at an unrolled image is, is that these images are, if I took this edge, and I took that edge and I peeled it around behind me and connected it, that would be the 360. right? Likewise, a lot of time, if I take the bottom and the top and I were to pull it down to my feet and pull the top up there, uh, I'd end up with the full 360 view. Okay? So when we look at an image like this, things in real life that are straight become curved, and things that are curved become straight. So it's this kind of weird counterintuitive thing. These walls here, while they feel like they bow out toward us, are actually straight. Uh, and if we were to curl the image back on itself, they would appear straight again. Okay? So another example, uh, the scalloped edges are when you don't have a full set of images. Uh, the images don't go all the way to the bottom or don't go all the way to the top. And we end up with um, little sets. They can be from far away. They can be from close up. Right? Uh, this was a, an example of a full 360. So if I were to curl it, the bottom would touch, the top would touch, the sides would both touch. But when I shot the set of images, I missed one piece of sky. Right? So I left this deliberately unfixed. Uh, certainly, I could, I could do some clone stamping in Photoshop and, and fix that so you wouldn't see it. Uh, but it's a good example of if you miss an image, you can have holes. Right? So remember what I said about straight lines become curved, curved lines become straight. right? This looks like a very traditional photograph with a series of straight lines, straight walls. It's actually shot directly from the center of Marai, which is a terraced uh, set of gardens in Peru. So we shot it from right there. right? And so if I flip back for just a second, right? these walls are circular. So when we unroll them, they appear perfectly flat. Right? I know they wave a little bit, but you get the idea. 
Um, so this is a good illustration of the difference between uh, a panorama and a still image. Right. This is uh, another example here uh, shot inside uh, a ruin of a building looking across uh, to another set of buildings in Olechetambo, Peru. Um, this is actually one that you'll have as an example set today that you can stitch. Yeah. In an ideal world when you're shooting it, if you don't exposure lock the camera, so you, you, you expose for the, generally it's the brightest section of the screen because the darker sections you can always lighten later in Photoshop. Um, you would look for the lightest place, expose for that, lock the exposure, and then shoot everything with that same exposure lock. If you don't do that, you'll end up with, and I think the next picture might have an example. Let me go forward a couple. Here, here's an example. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, this, the exposure lock went away, right? So the center stripe is fine. They're all exposed the same, right? This, the exposure changed. And you can actually see the edge of the image coming down here where the exposure is different and it's darker. And so this will become very noticeable. You can also see it up in the sky. Certainly something you could fix in Photoshop, right? You can make your manipulations and adjust it so that you wouldn't see that anymore. But it's better practice to do the exposure lock when you set, set all of the images so that when you stitch them together, you end up with um, an image that actually looks seamless. You can also do this where it's a high dynamic range image. So remember what we talked about last class, where we shoot three to seven images of each image. Uh, and so you might end up with, in that kind of a high dynamic range panoramic image, maybe uh, 144 images or something that are all composited together. So you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of detail out of it. I'm going to go back a couple more to this one here. Um, this was uh, an image that was shot in the old Amtrak train station in West Oakland. I think they've torn the building down now, unfortunately. It was a really cool building, really cool old building. Uh, ab abandoned, not a live train station anymore. Um, but anyway, the, the reason that this image is a good example is that when you're shooting from a series of images, so something like this might be 36 to 48 images that have been stitched together. When you're shooting like that, any movement in a scene right, ends up showing up as little ghosted images. So there was lots of people in this space. This happened to be for a studio that we were doing in Berkeley. So there was a bunch of students walking around when I shot this. All right, and you get this whole series of ghosted people where they're in one image and not in another image. And as, as you combine them together, you get these kind of half there people. And it can be a really interesting, neat effect uh, to that particular image. This image, by the way, was the one that spawned my whole thesis. Uh, so this was like the image. I shot it when I was an undergraduate, and it ended up being uh, the thesis. So same Worcester, day versus night, right? Essentially the same setup, um, same building. If you move on to Berkeley, you'll see Worcester a lot like this. Actually, this is this is a total side note, but it's kind of entertaining. Ber uh, Worcester is the one building on campus where it's very, very rare that the lights ever go out. Um, it's it's quite entertaining, actually. Every one of the, the studio floors. So this building up here is the studio towers. So when you move on, you'll have a, a, a desk that's in one of these floors. right? The lights are on sensors. So if people leave, the lights go off. right? The lights never go off, because somebody's always there. It's just really entertaining. It's, it's like one of those things, like in winter break, the Worcester Tower's dark. right? But the rest of the year, it's always lit. So anyway, it's fun. Uh, another example of how um, people can be in the image. Uh, this was a, a set that my friend and I did when we were trying to exp exp explain kind of how panoramas work. Uh, we decided to put ourselves in every single one of the images. So since it's shot from a multiple set of images that are then stitched together, right? You can have yourself looking at yourself, which is then looking at yourself, which is then looking at yourself, because it's a lot of series of images. Right? And so as you stitch it together, you can be kind of playful with it. Um, and so this was just in a computer lab. We were just goofing around, but the, the concept is still, still there. Right? The one thing you do have to be careful of, uh, another example here, this was in the Chabot Science Center. Uh, you can end up with a half a person. Right? So we have a set of legs, but no, no top. Right? Because there was a set of images that were shot here and a different set that were shot here, giving right, the lower half of one person without the top. Right, so you have to be a little bit aware of, of what, what can happen. More, 
more stuff. Uh, this was shot on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and because I understand the mechanics of how to shoot a panoramic image, I didn't have a tripod. I didn't have any of my gear. I didn't have any way of, of, of isolating it and shooting it. But I moved around the camera instead of moving the camera around me. Right? So if I was holding the camera here, instead of going like this, right, I held the camera here, and I moved, and I moved, and I moved as I shot to keep that as isolated as possible. And you get the panoramic image that ends up stitching together really nicely. Right? Uh, unfortunately, on something like this, it's really hard to to do the high and low, right? So you just get one stripe uh, around the center of the image, right? Another example here, uh, this is in uh, Alameda, right? On the beach, right? This is a full 360. This is another example of full 360. So the bottom matches up, comes all the way down. Top comes all the way up. We would be inside a little globe, right? Another example of a full 360. You get a lot of times with the lens flares, they look kind of funny. So you've got the sun there, and you've got the lens flares coming off on the various images. Um, when this ends up being more of a sphere, and you're looking at it, it doesn't look so goofy. You can tell I like hiking, too. Another thing I did before I had kids, right? <laughs> anyway. So this one here was one of the ones that I showed you as interactive. Right? So it has both the, the unrolled and the interactive. You can get creative with it. Um, this is in San Francisco, taken on top of a roof. But we didn't stitch it in the normal sense. Right? We did it so that we get the swoop um, as a kind of an artistic piece uh, instead of a traditional panorama. Uh, these were all images from my thesis. It was at the San Francisco airport. Um, so these are all actually directly out of my thesis. Stuff. And part of my thesis had to do with translating this into uh, an interconnectivity of spaces. Uh, and then I, I had to figure out how to draw these so that I could draw spherical perspectives because it had to do with projection of spherical projections on other walls. Anyway, um, so the, the final thesis drawing was this one, um, which you lose a lot of detail in the computer rendition. Um, this was actually 21 feet long. It was, it was backlit 21 feet on mylar and had little ghosted pickle all through it. Um, but you've got the primary um, spherical perspective right, looking down the center of this hallway. And then you had a bunch of spherical perspectives that went off to each side that were part of the, the spherical perspective. So it was kind of a double layered thing. It was really pretty fun. I have no idea where the drawing went. I used to have it, and it disappeared. OK, so now we're going to move over and talk about how we actually. OK, so sorry for that. Uh, obviously, I had to get my flash drive. So we're going to start um, with exercise 108. We're going to do a set of images in Photoshop, um, because I want to teach you Photoshop. And then I will ex show you how to work with Huggin. Uh, the hug-in part is optional. You have to do the Photoshop part. You have to make a post for Photoshop. Uh, but I would encourage you to play around with hug-in. Uh, we have a whole day devoted to this, so it's worth, it's worth um, kind of exploring how it works. Um, on the, on the uh, Digital Tools site, uh, there is a set of downloadable. So if I went to today's exercise, 108. At the bottom here, oh, I'm not logged in. Um, there are a bunch of zip packages that you can download that have photos for you to play with. Um, so you can pick any one of those three um, and see how do they, they end up stitching together. I already have them down on my flash drive. So when I'm in Photoshop, like I said, it doesn't work particularly well with a large full 360, but I can take a group of images and stitch those together. So I'm going to go to the File menu here, and I'm going to go to Automate. So this is exactly like we did with the Merge to HDR, only instead of picking Merge to HDR, I'm going to go to the last option here, which is called Photo Merge. And when I click on Photo Merge, I'm going to get the same kind of a little dialog box that pops up. Uh, but this one's going to be about panoramas. So I'm going to leave this on auto, because in all likelihood, auto is going to be able to detect the panorama easier than uh, me manually uh, specifying here. I'm going to go to Browse. And I'm going to go to my 108 
Uh, and here's the three examples that I have. We'll do the ET building for right now. And I'm going to look at this in as large icons so I can pick kind of a group of images here. Uh, I'm going to pick this, and I'm going to hold down Control to be able to select multiple. I'll select those three, and then I'm going to pick some high versions of those. So we'll pick like these three, and I'll pick a few low versions, maybe like those. And I'll go ahead and say OK. So I've selected a group of images. Not all of them, because again, it's not going to stitch the full 360 nicely. But I picked a few um, that, that should overlap. And I'll go ahead and say, OK, I do want to make sure that it says blend images together. right? And the vignette removal is kind of irrelevant. Um, if we had darkened edges on the pictures, we'd, we'd specify that. But for right now, we don't need to worry about it. Uh, and I, we shouldn't have any geometric distortion. So I'll go ahead and say, OK. And basically, what we're going to do is let Photoshop spend a little bit of time figuring out how to put these images together. And since this is an automated process, right? all we have to do is be patient while it tries to work on it. OK? So it's, it, it processed rather quickly. Uh, and it gave me uh, a set of images that went together. Right? It did an awfully good job stitching those together as a small group. Um, I'll do another example where I throw them all at it. And you can see that it doesn't, doesn't work quite as well. Uh, but one of the things that's really important to point out in this is that we have these images that have been warped. But then next to them, chained to them, we have these masks. So remember last class where we had the masks that we were working on? Right? What photo merge does is it, one, adjusts and warps the image a bit, but it also creates a mask that shows how these uh, kind of go together seamlessly. So if I were to turn this off, you can see that the, the edge of this image is not a straight edge. Right? It kind of weaves around. Let me use something like this. It weaves around along that edge. Let me zoom in so we can see it a little bit better. Right? And when I turn this one on, it becomes seamless. Right? So it's a very creative way of putting it together. And that's what Photo Merge is supposed to do and does. If we look really carefully, you can see that there's a little bit of a distortion right there on the roof. Right? But from farther away, it's really not, not too apparent. Okay? So let me go ahead, and I'm going to go to File New, and I'm going to throw a larger set of images at this. So I'm going to go to um, Automate Photo Merge. I'll browse. And I, uh, thank you. I knew somebody was going to correct me, right? Uh, automate photo merge. Amazing, I said photo merge, but anyway. Uh, let me go ahead and click browse, and I'm going to do all of these. down control and I made a copy. Sorry about that. So that was the full 360 and then I'll do the next set here of the higher ones. Yeah, but I, I'm not going to do the lower ones. So I could, but I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm going to try not to crash this when I, when I do it live. I might crash it. We'll see. So we'll give it a little bit more time to see how it does. Computers have definitely gotten faster. When I first started teaching this and we, we did photo merge, this would take like 20 minutes. And everybody would take a break while it was doing it. It's much faster now. It did a shockingly good job. <laughs> so I guess it's making a liar out of me, right? Um, the, the only challenge with this uh, is that we don't actually have a, sh we don't have a nice blended sharp point. So this tree here lines up with this tree here, right? And we don't have there, that point there is this point there. 
So we've got a little bit of overlap on that side, but it actually did a reasonably good job, um, better than I thought it was going to do. Okay? So again, it's an automated process, not too hard. Um, you'll, you can download these sample images to play with, or if you want to work with your own images, that's okay too. Um, even if you just have, if you want to go outside and shoot three or four images together and try to stitch those, that would be good too. Um, it's kind of up to you. You will then save this for web. So I'll go to File, Save for Web. And make sure it's a JPEG. I'll go ahead and click Save. Go to 108. On, on this one, you don't have to. On the next one, you are going to have to change the size. right? Um, and so I can go ahead and call this um, uh, DVC panorama, something like that, and click, click Save. You can change the size here if you want to, but for this, it, it's fine. Okay? The next one, when we make the interactive one, we need to be more careful with how it works. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and, and minimize Photoshop, and I'm going to open the program that's called Huggin. And so it should be available down in your taskbar. Uh, it looks like a little person standing in front of a landscape. right? Um, if it's not there, right? not all of the computers will have it there. If it's not there, if you go to the Start menu and you go to Computer, and then you go to your local disk C, and then you click on Program Files, you will be able to find Huggin there. And then you have to go in the Bin folder. I know this is very annoying. It's not in the Start menu. okay? Uh, and then Huggin will be inside of that Bin folder. And you can double click it to start it. Okay? So once again, that was in Computer, Local Disk C, Program Files, hug in, and then inside the bin folder. I'll write it down. OK, so hopefully you've been able to find it. Um, when we open up Huggin, right, we get the Huggin Panorama Stitcher. It gives us a tool tip of the day. We can go ahead and close that for right now. Uh, and so this is basically a, a preview of what we're, what we're doing. And up here, if we look at the tabs, we see something called Assistant. right? That's the tab that comes up by default, which is what we want. We're going to click on number one, Load Images. right? And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick a set of images. And I'm going to hold down Shift so that I can select them all. And I'll go ahead and say Open. And it will load in a set of images. Now, these images haven't been stitched together yet. So when we look at the preview, it doesn't really look like much. Right? So our next thing is to look forward. I've, I've loaded 39 images. Um, generally, it'll pull the default information from the camera itself. So this is a normal uh, with an 18.244 millimeter lens. Uh, I'll go ahead and click on Align, which is step two. And now it's going to go through. And, and what Huggin does is it brings up this little assistant so that you can see what it's actually doing. This is all uh, computer code that's going by. It's going through all 39 images right now, and it's analyzing the images. And then it's going to go between images. So it goes between each set of images, and it's going to say, how many matches does it find? Right? So it's looking for similar points in two images. And so it's going to go through each set of images uh, to figure out which image should go next to each other image. Right? So you guys have to bear with me for a second, because it's going to take a little bit of time to do this. Yeah. Let's see if we can find it. It's, it's entirely possible that it's not on the computer. It's supposed to be. Yeah, I would say you don't. All right, 
we'll see if we can uh, move you to a different one that does have it on it. Yeah. Those two don't? <laughs> it's amazing, you know, I tried to set this stuff up and whatever. Some of you, does anybody have it? Nobody has it? Great. All right, well, I'll continue to demo it, and then you can download it on your own and do it. All right, well, so you guys will spend your time doing Photoshop today. Okay, so it just finished its number crunching, and we see that it reorganizes the images into uh, a full, full set of panorama. 
So one of the interesting things is if we go over to uh, layout, we can see how the images are all interconnected and which ones are stitched to which other images. Uh, and that's part of what shows this uh, as the powerful application that it is. Right? Um, before we get too far along here, I'm going to go to the View menu, and I'm going to go to the Panorama Editor, which gives me a little bit more information. I'm going to make this large, and I'm going to click on Control Points. And this is where we can actually see the differences between the two images. So if we go between image 0, which is here, and image 1, right, we can see all of these little points with colors on them are points that the computer has recognized as being similar on one image versus another. Right? And so we can also see here that it's also connected to image 13. Right? So here's a different set of images where they're, they're compared. It's also set to image 15. So we see right here on the horizon, this little group of images matches up with that little group of images, or this little group of points. If we manually needed to, th these happen to have stitched together really nicely, but sometimes you'll have a group that doesn't stitch together or it can't recognize something that's similar, I can actually specify a point that's on one image uh, and where it is on the other image. So between 0 and between image 1, right? I can look here and I can say, OK, what's a similar point on a particular image? Right? Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit here. Right, there's a backpack. Let's see if I can get the same backpack. Right, so here I can see there's a backpack, there's a backpack. So the right, this little white edge of that stripe on the backpack right there matches up with that little point right there. And I can go ahead and click Add, and now it's another control point. Does that make sense? So I can manually go in and specify, which is part of what makes this uh, program very, very accurate. So once I'm done, I'm going to click on the Stitcher tab, and I'm going to change the settings. And again, you won't be able to do this because it's not installed for you. but uh, if you were able to, um, you'd go into projection, and it would be equirectangular. Field of view would be 360. The vertical, we'd want to be 180, which we'll do. Um, our canvas size would be 2048 by 1024, there. Uh, and my crop here would be uh, 0, 2048. Um, top would be 0. And bottom would be 180. Right? We want to do exposure corrected, low dynamic range. The format is going to be a JPEG and quality of 90. Right? Once I have that setting set, I'll go ahead and click on Stitch. And this is where it will actually make the stitched image for me. Okay? So I'll go ahead and say OK. It's going to ask me to save it. Uh, so we can save it here. That's fine and we'll let it do its thing. So it'll send it out to this batch processor, which is then going to process it for a while. Uh, and this can take a bit of time. Uh, so I won't make you sit here and watch me do it. Uh, but the point is, this is how you would stitch it if you wanted to stitch it with this. I apologize that it's not available on these computers. Uh, I swear I've double checked them and then should be. But for whatever reason, it's on this one. <laughs> but go figure, right? That's probably the one I checked. So um, anyway, you don't have a requirement to do the hug-in part today. Uh, you only have to stitch the Photoshop part, which means that you don't need to make the interactive panorama. You just need to post an image, a still image. Okay? Because the interactive one, uh, which I say in part two, step two and three, um, it won't work if it's not exactly the same configuration. Um, so the Photoshop one won't end up working for it. Okay? So you'll just have one post today. Uh, if you have any remaining time, it would be a good idea to start thinking about your assignment 2 or 102. Um, we will spend a little bit more time isolating objects, and I'll show you some of the techniques. I'll also show you some sample images from previous classes to get your ideas flowing on Wednesday. Okay? Are there any questions? No? All right.